So tonight, I want you to bow your heads with me as we open God's word again. Lord, I stand before you again tonight as your servant. I feel very inadequate. There's a lot more voices out there that are more polished. And, but I just am sharing my heart tonight again, Lord, and I just want you to be with, be with me and those that have come that we'll receive understanding, that your word will be plain and clear to us, that we'll understand the heart of God in a much clearer way how much you love us. So bless this time together now, we pray. Amen. So what happens when you die? There are probably four or five major belief systems out there that we need to consider. When you die, you either go to heaven or you go to hell. Simple as that. Now, if you've kind of been in between, the one of the major religions of the world says you go to a place called purgatory. And there you got to prove yourself which direction you go. One of the largest religions in the world, the Hindu religion, believes that you never die. You come back in another life, reincarnation. And if you've been good, if karma is good, then you kind of move up the food chain. If you're not so good, you move down the food chain. And in that whole system of, of belief, you get to the top of the heap, the highest in that level of the food chain is to become a cow. That's the holy of holies. Or another belief system is that absolutely nothing happens. Now let's face it, they all cannot be right. So we want to look at the Bible tonight to see what the Bible says. I want to begin by telling you a, a tragic story that took place more than 60 years ago. In 1956 in the Belgian Congo, it was gripped in a civil war. And there was a wonderful hospital there the hospital administrator, Dr. Dr. Paul Carson. While he was there, the rebel forces came in, captured that hospital. Many of the employees were killed. And unfortunately, Dr. Carl Carson was one of those who died tragically. It was a horrible event. When Dr. Carson's body was found a few days later, after this totally senseless murder, there was a little New Testament tucked in his jacket pocket. And they pulled it out, and they opened it up, and in its pages, the doctor had written just the day before he died, the day before he was shot, he penned a single word. Peace. Peace. Peace in the face of some of the most Horrible of circumstances. Peace in the face of death. What gave Dr. Carlson such peace? Is it possible for us tonight to have this incredible peace when we face death circumstances that are truly tragic? What can, what can help us from keeping from falling apart. When death strikes, there are so many unanswered questions regarding death. What really happens when a person dies? Is it heaven? Is it hell? Is it nothingness? We know what's happened to the physical body, but where is the person who lived in it? Well, what has happened to him or her? When people die, do they... Do they totally cease to exist or, or do they live somewhere else? The pain of death is probably one of the most excruciating pains that people experience in this journey. Because it, it is so final. Because of that finality, we desperately want to believe that there must be some way that the ones that we loved, the ones that we cherished, are not really gone. And that if we search hard enough, 
we'll find a way to still talk with them somehow. So the question is, does the Bible have anything to say about what, hap what happens when we die? Well, I'm glad to tell you tonight, my friends, the answer is an emphatic yes. In fact, our search leads us right to the very heart of God. Discovering the heart of God, we can see the heart of God in this topic. And the hope of the early Christian church, after Jesus died on the cross, his friends placed Jesus, you know, that whole resurrection, the Calvary scene. His friends placed Jesus in a tomb. A cave, actually. The Roman governor, Pilate, sent a guard and his soldiers where they sealed the tomb with a large, large stone, and then they put the seal of the, of the governor on that tomb. We don't have to review the whole crucifixion, resurrection scene, but there's the body of Christ now sealed in that tomb. No one without the permission of the, of the king could, or the governor could go in that tomb. No one that is except Christ's father. And we know this story early Sunday morning while it was still dark out. This brilliant angel descends from heaven and rolls back the stone, covering the opening of that stone and calls Christ forth. And the risen Savior steps out in complete victory over death. As a mighty conqueror, he steps forth, and the soldiers that were assigned were literally struck down by, by the glory of the angel. I mean, they were as though they were dead men, the Bible says. So the story of Christ's resurrection became the driving force of the early Christian church. That's all they could talk about. The risen Lord, Jesus, the miracles that he, that he displayed to the world. Their confidence in the resurrection stood in bright contrast to the beliefs of the pagans who had no hope beyond the grave. In that culture, everyone believed that once you died, that was it. No mas. But the Christians now had a message of glorious hope. You see, the grave was not the end. Praise God. Those who died in Christ would someday live again. And that was the heartbeat of the early church. If you go to the catacombs in Rome, under the city there, you can see the difference between the pagans' death in those ancient tombstones and in the, in, in, in the inscriptions and that of the Christians. Notice the inscriptions on the tombs of the Christians. Goodbye until we meet again. Hmm. Or good night until the morning. This is just not that many years after the resurrection. Their tombs were inscribed with hope and courage, looking forward to the day of the resurrection. Their hope and courage in death was founded in the resurrection and the promise that our Savior Jesus Christ displayed. But then you contrast that with the unbelievers. Goodbye forever. Adios, Señor. No mas, or whatever. I don't know. It's, it's over. In the book of Revelation, wonderful chapter. The first chapter, we read these words. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, am I alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. Hades, that's a Greek word for hell. I have the keys of Hades and of death. You see, my friends, the resurrection of Christ is our Christian's foundation. It's our hope. It's the cornerstone of what we believe. And the Apostle Paul, he 
persuades, he argues persuasively that there is life after death, but only after the resurrection. So he clearly states that if there's no resurrection, then there's no future for the Christian. And he says, for if the dead do not rise, then Christ has not risen. Do you see how strong that, that is? And then he continues, and if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. But to understand why he says this, we need to understand clearly what the Bible teaches about death itself. So we're going to look at that for a few minutes. We talked about it last night. Death came upon mankind because mankind was separated by sin from God, the source of light, of life. Adam and Eve, they made that intentional choice to dis disobey God. And so God told Adam after his fall, you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread. Till what? Till you return to the ground. What's he referring to there? Till you die. Till you die. For out of you were take, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. So here is a key to understanding what death is all about. The Bible says that man in death returns to the dust from which he was taken. Now notice how God created Adam. It's very plain. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So God took the elements, the dirt, the clay, shaped Adam into this, what looked like a human being, looked like a man. When he was finished, he fashioned it. But all he had there was a lifeless form made from clay and dirt. It's only a body, only a form but it took something miraculous to make him a living being. And the Bible says here that God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, and Adam became a living being. We might make an equation kind of like this. The lump of clay, that image of the body, plus the breath equals a living soul. Well, then the opposite of that would be true. For in death, then we would, we would say a living person minus death becomes a lump of clay or a corpse. Does that make sense? Of course. You know, many funerals you've been to. Earth to earth, ash to ash, you know, dust to dust. You just come to understanding that that's when you die, that's where you're headed. The wisest man that ever lived... King Solomon. I love reading the book of Ecclesiastes. Little, little bumper sticker things all over there. But in Ecclesiastes 12, this is what King Solomon said. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was. And notice this. And the spirit will return to God who gave it. The spirit returned to God. That word spirit in the original language is the same thing as breath. Breath. And the breath was returned to God. Now, this is essentially the same thing that the book of Job that we read a little bit last night. This is what Job had to say about death. Listen to what he said. As long as my breath is in me and the breath of, my, of, of God in my nostrils, that breath is what God, that, that's the breath that God puts into our nostrils when he created us. The psalmist says the same thing. He said, do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man, in whom there is no help. His spirit departs, again, that word spirit, breath. His spirit re de departs, he returns to his, to his earth, in that very day his plans perish. King David here reveals 
an important truth about death. When he says that the breath leaves the body, returns to the earth, man dies, his conscious thoughts stop. And again in Ecclesiastes, this harmonizes with what King Solomon said, for the living know that they will die. All of us here, I raise my hand, no surprise. But the dead know nothing. Not, now nothing means they don't know anything. And they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. The dead, in the old King James it says, the dead know not anything. Also their love, their hatred, their envy have now perished. They know nothing. Nothing. Does nothing mean something? No. It means nothing. And this is in keeping with the psalmist wrote, that not even the righteous dead, not even the righteous dead, those who are good, who died in Jesus, not even the righteous dead are in heaven praising God. Notice what he says, Psalm 115, verse 17. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down into silence. When you go down to silence, that's another term for, that's a nice way of saying, when you go down into the grave. So here the Bible makes it very clear that the dead simply wait until the resurrection day. Job, he says, if a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my hard service I will wait till my change comes. You shall call and I will answer you. So when does that happen? At that great resurrection, at that call. Now notice how death is described here in Job. But man dies and is laid away. Indeed, he breathes his last. And where is he? If I wait for the grave as my house and if I make my bed in the darkness. So man lies down and does not rise till the heavens are no more. They will not awake nor be roused from their sleep. Oh, that you would hide me in the grave, that you would conceal me until your wrath is past, that you would appoint me a set time and remember me. Notice, Job uses the word sleep in talking about death. And many other Bible writers describe death in the same way. Psalms, book of Psalms, David wrote, Consider and hear me, O Lord, O Lord my God, enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of what? Of death. So there's no confusion there. It's pretty plain what that term death means, or sleep means. And, the, and Daniel, the prophet, tells about the dead who will be raised. He says, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Jesus himself uses the term sleep to describe the death of one of his closest friends. You know the story well. Songs have been written about it. I think every Sunday school or Sabbath school class has told the story about Lazarus. So there was this home in Bethany that Jesus just loved to visit often. The home of Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. It says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And so one day when Jesus is and his disciples, they're out by the Jordan River, he receives an ur urgent message from one of the three friends of Mary and Martha and Lazarus that Lazarus is very ill and he's facing death. But what does Jesus do instead of going immediately? He stays two more days out there by the Jordan. John 11, then Jesus said to the messenger, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but go, go that I may wake him. And then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. 
I'm going to back up here. When Jesus was referring to Lazarus at that time, he didn't know the severity of his illness. But then the disciples, when they hear that Jesus uses the term sleep, even they misunderstood. And so they got this big smile on their face, and they said, well, if he sleeps, he'll get well. And now here's where Jesus puts the ringer. And then Jesus says to them plainly, Lazarus, Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. We'll talk about that in just a minute. So they went their way to Bethany, where the family lived. And as they approached the city, Martha sees them coming. And she comes running to them. I'm sure there were tears in her eyes, tear-stained mud dripping down her face. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would have died. And Jesus says to her, your brother will live, will rise again. Oh, well, Mary's, Martha's heart, note, no, notice carefully Martha's response. She says, yes, I know that he'll arise again in the resurrection at the last day. You see, she understood when, what happens after a person dies, when they'll be raised back to life again at the last day. And Jesus says to her, this one of the most wonderful verses that we know, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Praise God, friends. Even though he dies, he shall live. Well, Martha assured Jesus that, she assured Jesus that yes, she expected to see Lazarus in the resurrection at the end of the world. However, Jesus is about to give a dramatic preview of that event at the end of the world. As Jesus came to Lazarus' tomb, he asked that this stone sealing the entrance be taken away. Now, somewhere in my reading, and, and I try to look it up, to, I bet you Pastor Alvin here has this. But there was an understanding among that culture that the spirit within a person lingered for three days. And after three days, gone. Jesus stays away how long? Four days. He's four days late. So now there's no room for any of the skeptics and the critics to use that excuse that, well, it's within three days. I, I need to look that has that, that cultural reality, and I, I want to find it and try to quote it to you more accurately. But... Jesus asked the stone to be removed to be removed. And here's Martha now. She's very concerned about this request. I mean, they didn't have embalming fluids back then. You know, he's wrapped in his grave clothes in this tomb, in this hollowed out tomb. And Mary or Martha, probably Mary, she said, Lord, by this time, he's starting to rot and he's starting to stink. For he's been dead four days. You get the picture? But the stones rolled away, and Jesus stands before that, that tomb, and he cries out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. I heard a sermon preached by one of my favorite, favorite people in the world, Doug Batchelor, and he said, you know, if Jesus had not called Lazarus by his first name, Lazarus come forth, if he had just said come forth, boop, 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 all over that country, so all the graves would have popped open. 
and they'd have been, there'd have been the sight for eternity. But no, he called Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus, there he came, start walking out. The one who'd been dead for four days, he heard the voice of the life giver, Jesus. Oh, what, a, what an incredible day. I mean, I, I try, at times I just try to close my eyes and, and just kind of play a panorama in my mind and, my, and just try to envision and hear the sounds and the sights of, of some of these events. And what an incredible day that must have been for Lazarus and his family and his friends there in Bethany. Can you imagine the rejoicing and the celebrating and the happiness? I mean, beyond measure, Lazarus is alive. Friends, that was only a small preview of the glory and the excitement that will occur when Jesus comes again and all the graves of his other friends will be opened. We're going to be talking about that tomorrow night, about the second coming. And all of these who have died in Christ will rise and meet him in the air. Hmm. The question for you is this. If you're a friend of Jesus, you don't have to worry about death. You don't have to fear death. This is a message of comfort. Because if you know Jesus, very next conscious thoughts, if when you die, you're going to be, to be looking into his face. The Apostle Paul, he shared with the early church this message. Again, he made this reference because the term ignorant is not a, um, it's not a negative term. We've made it into a negative term. But if you're ignorant about something, it means you just don't know. Um, now, if you're an ignoramus, I don't know, maybe that's different. <laughs> but he's saying, he's saying, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who fall asleep, lest you sorrow as the ignorant ones out there who have no hope. But he was saying they're ignorant because they don't know. Okay? So Paul tells us what Jesus will do when he comes a second time. And he quotes this in the first book of Thessalonians. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Do you get that? Amen. One of the most comforting truths in God's word is that when a person dies, he or she rests quietly, undisturbed by the problems of this life. Until the life giver calls. And this is why the second advent of Jesus, of Christ, and his, and his resurrection of the righteous, this was anticipated by the early Christian church. And they referred to it as the blessed hope. The blessed hope. Paul describes in detail events that will occur on that day. And he says, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Okay, there we go. There's that term again. We shall not all be dead, he's saying. But we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead in Christ will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Paul got it. He understood it. He says, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. When does immortality happen? When are we given an immortal body? Now or at the resurrection? Now this is where, friends, I can get myself in trouble with people who are God-loving, fearing people. There's a belief in many Christian churches that when we are born, our soul or our body or whatever you call that, that spirit is immortal. It lives on and on and on. The immortality of the soul. 
Paul makes it very clear that we put on immortality at the second coming of Jesus. And in the meantime, we are in the grave. We are asleep. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? This, is, this passage by Paul is in complete harmony with what the Savior told his disciples. Now, I've got to pause here for just a moment. Because with this topic, we referred to hell a number of times. Usually I take a whole evening to discuss it. We have a whole set of studies. We're not going to be able to cover this in the next three, three sessions together. But I'm just, I'm just going to read you a few passages that I've pulled out of my little study book here. We've already come to an understanding during this week together that, one, uh, that discovering one of the character, characteristics of God, God is a God of love. And God is not willing that any should perish. We read that in, in 2 Peter. And in Malachi, and we'll give you the... In fact, I'm going to actually make a printout of, of these passages, these texts, because I want you to go home and study these for yourself. But in the book of Malachi 4, sinners will be ultimately burned up or turned to ashes. That's what Malachi says. And then the book of Psalm 37, the wicked shall not be. Psalm 37, the wicked shall perish they, and shall consume away. Psalm 37, the wicked will not be found. Matthew 25, the punishment will be everlasting. Note that the text in Matthew 25, when you read it, the text does not, stay, does not say everlasting punishing. It says everlasting punishment. That means it, its effects last forever. And if you want proof of that in Jude 7, in that chapter, that, that single chapter book, there in, in Jude 7, Sodom and Gomorrah are examples of everlasting punishment and eternal fire. However, I'll make a question for you. Are Sodom and Gomorrah still burning today? No. These are cities that lie in ruins in the bottom of the, of the Dead Sea. And then 2 Peter, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah are turned into ashes. So these passages, as possible, a lot more. When we talk about eternal punishment, that means the punishment the person who's being punished, once their body is consumed and the fire has consumed them, the punishment will last forever. Doesn't mean that they're going to be, and, and I'm going I'm to refer to you tonight. There's a wonderful movie. I don't know if it's on Netflix or YouTube, or, but I want you to just jot this down. There's a movie that will just explain so much to you. It's called Hell and Mr. Fudge. And the movie basically has this premise. Hell and Mr. Fudge. Here's a 13-year-old boy. He grows up in a Christian home. He's the nicest kid, respectful. He goes to church. He studies his Bible. But he's got a couple of, of teenage friends that are real stinkers. And he goes out with them one night, and he starts drinking, and he jumps in their car, and he comes home, and he's involved in an accident, and he's killed, and because of his sin, now there's going to be eternal hell. He's going to burn forever and ever and ever and be tortured in the lake of fire because of that one sin. I don't know what that says to you, but that doesn't, that doesn't paint a very loving picture of God. And I'm happy to tell you tonight, friends, Many, many mainline Protestant churches have abandoned that understanding of hell. Praise God. Because there are many, many passages in Scripture that we'll be touching on in the next few nights that talk about death and destruction, the destruction of Satan and all of his angels. 
Oh, but way over here in the secret part of the planet, God has this furnace going, and he's going to keep it miraculously going forever and ever, you know, for the little 13-year-old that took too many, you know, two, two, two beers too many. Are you with me? I, I just encourage you to watch that movie. It'll answer so many of your questions. But as I said, many, many Christian churches, many mainline Protestant churches have come to understand that they've misunderstood that whole concept of, of heaven and hell. I won't take the time tonight to give you some of the history of where the ever-burning fire of hell, where that originated, but I just uh, will just kind of drop you a little clue. It came from back in the Roman Empire and the Roman Church. Anyway, I'll have a printout of these texts that you can actually go to your Bibles and you can look at Alvin has some study guides that will help as well. So there's this definition of hell, this ever-burning punishment. John 5, 28. We're going to continue now. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming which all who are in the graves will hear his voice. So here's another interesting little tidbit. If, when a person dies, they either go to heaven or hell at death, then why is it that the coming of Jesus, that when they're in the graves, this is where they hear, they hear his voice for the first time, if they're already in heaven? That doesn't make sense. And come for those who have done good to the resurrection of, of life and those who have done evil to the resur resurrection of condemnation. When is, the re when is the reward given for heaven or hell? And if we want to use have a hell, we'll use that to, that's the expression, there is going to be a hell, but it's not going to be an ever-burning hell. Think for a moment, if people went either to heaven or hell right at death, why would there need to be need for a resurrection, either for the righteous or the unrighteous at the end of time? That text we just read would make that foolish. Why would Jesus make this statement as he comes back the second time at a funeral? Been in many funerals. Tell you what troubles me. Every funeral I ever went, I've ever been to, everyone is already in heaven. Have you ever been to a funeral where they offer words of sympathy to the evil one right now who's burning in hell? I mean, I've been to funerals where everybody knows that rascal had no spiritual bone in him. You know, was a corrupt, evil person. But no, he's now with Jesus. Revelation tells us very plainly that the reward is given to the righteous or the wicked. And here's the words from Revelation 22. And behold, I'm coming. I'm coming quickly. And my reward is with me to give everyone according to his work. What is the, when does the judgment take place? At the resurrection. Not when someone dies. I don't know, to me, it seems so plain. I, it, just, it just makes so much sense. When people die, they're sleeping. They're resting from their labors and their troubles. They're resting until Jesus comes. What is Jesus coming for? He's coming to resurrect all of his friends. Those who have gone before those who are alive at that time, they're, they, the dead will be resurrected first, and then we who remain, or he, we who are alive, will be caught up together with them in the air, ever to be with our Lord. You see, Jesus' sacrifice at Calvary 
when we accept him into our lives, that means we have been, we can sing that song that's one of the church's favorite songs. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood. What are the redeemed? The redeemed, in other words, they're the ones who are saved. They're saved by the blood of Jesus. Nothing that they've done on their behalf. Jesus also comes to welcome those who are living, his faithful followers at that time. Now, we'll spend some time tomorrow night on this amazing topic of the, of the second coming, kind of fill in some of the things that we've skipped over a little bit tonight. But just listen to this good news. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the cloud. Now, who is it? Who's the them? We caught up together with them. The righteous dead who have been resurrected. And the them also includes their angels, their guardian angels. Caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Oh, this, this is just such a glorious thought. And thus, we shall always be with the Lord. And thus we. I'm including myself in that we tonight. And I hope your heart is there too. That this is something that you want in your journey. So we clearly see. That all of the saved. Will have these glorified bodies. Just like Jesus. And they receive immortality. They receive eternal life at his second coming, so that they will be with their Lord forever. But the question always comes up. Okay, Jody, I got one for you. What about the story of the thief on the cross? The guy was nailed next to Jesus. Didn't Jesus say something about going with him to heaven right away? Didn't he go to heaven with Jesus on that same day that he died? Well, let's see what the Bible actually says about that. What it teaches about that thief and the promise that Jesus gave. You see, we know the story. Jesus is crucified between two thieves. And the book of Mark says that at first both of these thieves were taunting and, and just ridiculing Jesus. Saying that, you know, hey, if you really are the son of God, come off that cross and, you know, and save us all, deliver us. But then one of the thieves, I don't know the circumstances that happened right there. But one of the thieves becomes repentant. And on the cross, this rotten scoundrel, the heart of God is touched in his heart. And he calls out for salvation. Now I'm a human being. And I have human emotions. I know what I'd have said at that time. Are you kidding me? After all the pain and suffering and all the agony you've caused all these people? Not a chance. Oh, but this just shows you the love of our Father. We read in Luke 23. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, please understand this. This is a thief on the cross. I don't know how much, I don't think this guy had much religious background. But do you see what he just referred to? Remember me when you come into your kingdom? There must have been something he knew about Jesus that this was not final. So even the thief understood when the reward was given. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. There it is, Jody, right there. As we've been talking about this week, you have to understand you can't base a theology or a belief on one or two passages. You have to look at the entirety of Scripture and see how, how all those pieces fit together. So we need to realize either this passage is wrong 
or there's something we're not understanding about this passage. So some think that Jesus was promising that the, that the thief that very time that he would immediately go to, to paradise with him that very day. That's what that passage would infer. Would you agree? But here's the reality. Jesus himself did not go immediately to paradise when he died. Let's read. The Bible tells us that he died on that day, Friday, and was buried in a borrowed tomb. So then we skip ahead to resurrection morning. Sunday morning, Jesus appears to Mary. And, Jesus is, and, and Mary is so overwhelmed, she wants to come and she wants to wrap her arms around Jesus and she wants to kiss and hug him and, and worship him. And Jesus restrains her because he told her that he had not yet ascended to the Father. He had not ascended to heaven. Listen, listen to what he said. Don't touch me. I've not yet ascended to my Father. I don't have time to go into the, uh, the, the religious, the, 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 the theology behind why Jesus was not, why he was not able to be touched. But just bear with me. Touch me not, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. Now, this was Sunday morning when Jesus said this. Sunday morning. He said that he had not yet ascended to his Father. So it's plain to see that Jesus could not have been in paradise with a thief on the cross on Friday. He himself disclaims that. The Bible tells us that the, that the thief was not on, uh, in, in paradise on Friday either. Look at uh, John. It says, therefore, because it was the preparation day, the Jewish kingdom and their relig Jewish religion, preparation day was Friday. Saturday was their Sabbath. The preparation day was the day they got all their busy work done so that they would have the Sabbath to honor in his, holy, in his holy way. So it says, therefore, because it was the preparation day, that the body should not remain on the cross on Sabbath. And again, now this gets into this whole convoluted, the, the Pharisees and Sadducees and those religious leaders, leader, leaders of the day had set up so many rules and regulations that it was virtually impossible for anyone to, to keep the Sabbath holy. In fact, their whole understanding was the reason we're making all these rules and regulations is if the, if the entire nation of Israel keeps the Sabbath holy one day, the whole nation, then the Messiah would come. And so they kept adding all these rules and regulations. One of them was they couldn't leave a... They couldn't leave someone hanging on the cross on the Sabbath that they had just crucified. Sabbath is a high day. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. You get that picture? Okay. They were hanging on the cross. They don't die immediately. History tells us many of those people that were hung on a cross lived for days in anguish. So they wanted to end it. They wanted to you know, make it short. So then the soldiers came, and they broke the legs of the first of the uh, at first and of the other who was crucified with him. In other words, they broke the legs of those thieves on both sides of Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. So here we see that they broke the legs of the two thieves so they couldn't escape. But they didn't break Jesus' legs because were, he was already dead on Friday. So neither, neither Christ nor the thief were in paradise on Friday. Now, we don't have time to talk about the way they kept the calendar. Their calendar was from, from sunrise to sunrise was a day. From morning, so I'm sorry, from, from sunset to sunset was a day. And so because it's Friday night 
and it's coming close to the Sabbath, that's why they have to get all that done. Even to this day, the Jewish calendar is from sunset to sunset. We'll talk more about that later. So, let's get back to this question. Why did Jesus then say to, to the thief, I say unto you, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Why did he say that? Okay. Now, you've got to remember, I'm not a Greek scholar. The few hours I took of Greek, I realized that I was way, way too low on that food chain. And I, I would just have to do something else with the, the, the gray matter that the Lord gave me. But I do remember a few, a few things in that class. In the original Greek, if you've ever seen a Greek Bible, if you ever see a, a Jew with his Greek Bible, just have him show it to you. It's just all Greek letters going from right to left. There's no periods. There's no punctuation marks. There's nothing. And so the English translators, they added periods and commas where they thought best. And this is one of those places where many, many Bible scholars realize that if they simply move the comma over one word, now it clears up and it completely makes the picture so much different. Jesus was, Jesus was actually promising the thief on that day that he could have the assurance of being with him in paradise. So what he really said is this, I say to you today, I'm telling you right now, I'm telling you this very minute, you're going to be with me in paradise. There's a huge difference. So here there's this thief dying on the cross. No hope for him. When all he could see was darkness that terrified his soul, Jesus could promise him hope beyond the grave. Jesus promised that thief that very hour, yes, I say to you, you will be with me in paradise. I've used this illustration already twice during this week, but I absolutely love it. So now that we understand, where, where is that thief right now? He's in the grave. His bones, his flesh, and he's dead. He's dust to dust. The great resurrection morning. God is going to send an angel to raise that thief. Now, you've got to understand that thief knew nothing about the plan of salvation. He didn't understand anything about the second coming. He didn't under all of the religious beliefs that we kind of think is, are important. So here is that angel resurrecting that thief. We're going to talk about the second coming and, and the journey to heaven. So here's the thief in heaven. And I just, I liked in my mind, it just, you know, he's still in his tattered garb. What's that guy doing here? Maybe, maybe some of the people that knew him in Jerusalem knew what a crook he was. And they gave their heart to Jesus after the resurrection and after Jesus was crucified. And they recognized him. How did you get here? I just love this. The man in the middle invited me. The man in the middle invited me. I don't know what that does to your heart, but man. The man in the middle invited me and you. While hanging next to Jesus, that thief in the cross, gave him the greatest gift that he had ever heard, that he had ever experienced. The greatest gift that ever can be given to men and, men and women, boys and girls, is that gift of having assurance of eternal life. And that gift is ours tonight. Victory over death. That death that we experience here in this journey, 
It's just a little nap. It's just a little nap time. And so we, when we lose a loved one, we can be very comforted by the hope of the resurrection. We're comforted by the promise of being reunited with all those who've gone before us, all the saints from all the ages. So understanding the truth about death is very important. But as I close now, I want to just warn you, the devil is a great deceiver. And he's a great impersonator. Many have believed his deceptions because they didn't understand what happens when a person dies. People become very vulnerable to Satan's deceptions, especially after someone that they love in their family dies. And so what do you have? You end up then with these people going to fortune tellers or crystal balls or the tarot cards or, or the psychic readers or, or the tea leaves or divination or, or the occult or the Ouija board, you name it. They go to these sources to try to reconnect with their loved ones. There's a very well-known pastor who tells a story of a missionary family in Africa. It was an era when travel was, wasn't easy. Steamships like this were the mode of travel, and it took them months for them to reach their mission post in Africa from the United States. And tragedy struck when this beautiful couple, their little six-year-old, little son Timmy, contracted malaria and died. This was their only child. These parents were heartbroken. Their joy was gone. Their, the, the happiness, the laughter in their home was, was quiet. Their heart ached. But the work of the mission had to go on. And so one day while the wife was working alone in her kitchen, her husband was visiting one of the other villages. While working in the kitchen, she heard the screen door open. And she turned around and was startled to see the form of her little, of her little boy, Timmy, coming toward her. Mommy, mommy, he cried. Everything in her heart, everything in her life, she wanted to believe that this was Timmy. But she knew better. She knew what the Bible taught about death. And she knew this must be a deception. And so she said, you can't be Timmy. Jesus and the Bible say that the dead don't know anything. And the minute she mentioned Jesus and the Bible, that figure before her changed, and instead of Timmy, she saw an evil angel, which disappeared. And as she reflects this, and as she related this story, she was confident that what she saw with her eyes was an evil imposter, a demon that tried to deceive her. Now, we talked earlier about the guarding angels that I have that you have, when you recognize that one third of the heavenly host of those angels followed Lucifer, followed Satan to this earth, do you think for one minute that they're sitting back just kind of watching? Or do you think they're actively involved in trying to deceive you and me? That's a rhetorical question. You know, perhaps... You've had questions about death, as all of us have. We've all lost loved ones. Long to be reunited. Got some videos and DVDs of my mom and dad. They've both been gone now a number of years. I just can't wait to stand next to my dad and have him sing that bass in the heavenly choir. Long to be reunited with our loved ones. And the good news, my friends, is that the Bible's teaching on death is very clear. Those that have died, they're not aware of the passing of time. 
They're not having to watch us go through all this agony and torture and the suffering that we're going through, the difficulties and the hard times. I was talking to a friend of mine. We had a little Bible study together, and they were trying to convince me, oh, no, my mom's up in heaven. But this individual whose daughter was suffering from extreme uh, pain and anguish from cancer, I said, are you trying to tell me you're happy that your mom can look down and see this happening and she can't do anything about it? If she was really by Jesus' side, wouldn't, wouldn't she want to come down and do something? Well, yeah. Friends, they're not having to watch us suffer and go through all these hard times. They're resting. Jesus called it a sleep. And they're waiting for that, that, that voice of Jesus. In that great getting up morning, when Jesus calls, the voice of Jesus calls, pierce through the tombs, those tombs that were right next to Lazarus. Jesus' voice will thunder through this whole world. And with a shout and the voice of the archangel and all who have died in Christ as will rise first. And then we who are alive will be caught up together with the Lord, loved ones to meet the Lord in the air. These were the words that the Apostle Paul described the heart of God. We've been trying to discover the heart of God this week. Oh, friends, please know this. God wants to spend eternity with us. We don't need to be afraid of death. Again, it's just like a little nap for those who know Jesus as their Savior. I just want to say thank you, Lord, tonight that he has conquered death, that he came victorious from that grave. What a day that'll be when my Jesus I shall see, when I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me to that promised land. What a day. What a glorious day that will be. I'd like to give you a chance tonight to just make a commitment or make a recommitment in your life, in your heart, to the life giver. Why don't you just stand with me and as you stand, you're basically saying, Lord, I'm with you. Amen. Father, tonight, we're standing before you, thankful that you have, that we can find life, that we can find eternal life with you. We're thankful that we don't need to fear death. We... We, we look at the empty tomb and we see that you have already conquered the grave and we're thankful for that, Jesus. Tonight, many of us, we've lost loved ones. Many of us are sick. Many of us have ailments. Many of us, our time may not be that long, but Lord, we are so grateful that if we know you and we fall asleep, in Jesus, it'll be just be a blink. Lord, thank you that you've promised eternal life. So tonight we're coming and once again asking you to give us the gift of life through Jesus Christ. We're asking you to give us new hearts and new minds and to make us new creatures in Christ. Thank you for making it clear in your word that, that your word says what really happens after death is nothing that we need to be afraid of. Amen. Lord, please keep us safe from deception, from falsehoods, from the, the enemy's sly devices. Please, Lord, tonight comfort those here who may be grieving, those that are needing a special touch. May your words of truth fill all of us with hope for a better tomorrow. Well, there'll, there'll be no more sickness. There'll be no sadness, no suffering, no death. Oh, Lord, we want to be ready for that day. So, Lord, please bless us tonight and keep us faithful 
Until that day, we pray in your name. Amen.